Congress is very busy wrapping up the year as Democrats prepare to hand control of the House of Representatives to Republicans in January. Among the to-do list items is passing a government funding bill before tomorrow's midnight deadline. We're also waiting the long-anticipated final report from the January 6th committee and transcripts from their interviews, as well as the release of former President Donald Trump's tax returns. So joining me now to talk about all of these year-end items are my two CBS News colleagues. Can we have congressional correspondent Scott McFarlane at the desk here with me and senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe joining us from the White House. Uh, good to see you both um, on this almost School's almost out. Almost. Um, Scott, there are lots of storms coming. Members of Congress are eager to get out of town. Some of them already have, but they still have to pass the spending bill. What's the latest? Yeah, it'll happen tomorrow. And the only reason why it's being pushed off is because the Senate passed the bill this afternoon. They actually have to move all the paperwork and do the things they need to do to get it to the House before the House can vote on it. So they're going to reconvene tomorrow morning and finish the job. One of the virtues of the U.S. House at this moment is that they have proxy voting, which allows members who are concerned about the storm to be at home and vote remotely through a colleague. So it'll happen. It'll pass. Shutdown will be averted. $1.7 trillion will be spent. And it happened, I think, with, the, with very little time to spare. Very little time to spare indeed. Hopefully that means you get a holiday. Um, Ed, over to you. Uh, the president is also eager to leave town, I'm sure. Um, he did address uh, the public today in a uh, Christmas time speech, I would say. Um, anything new come out of that? What's kind of on his mind as things wrap up here in Washington? It was his hallmark card to America, Caitlin. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of just holiday cheer and uh, re recalling uh, the year that was and hoping that uh, 2023 and the holiday season can perhaps unite the country a bit more than it was at times this year. Uh, remember, this is a person who uh, had incredible loss in his life 50 years ago this week when his wife and young daughter were killed in a car accident. His two young sons were injured and his entire political career and reason for living was completely upended. He actually spoke about that briefly in this speech, recalling that you know, he is someone who has struggled with profound loss uh, around the holidays, and he knows that millions of people are as well, given the pandemic and the fact that about a million Americans, give or take, have died over the course of the last three years. And he was encouraging people to spend some time this holiday season reflecting. Uh, this is arguably one of the more presidential addresses he's given in the sense that he's sort of just serving as leader of the country and, and embodying the institution and hoping that people will come together. But virtually no policy announcements in that one at all. And in a signal that he wasn't going to take questions, the first lady showed up. She is someone who has, uh, especially in recent weeks, tried to rein him in a bit especially as the family prepares to start thinking more seriously about a re-election campaign, which we are still anticipating will begin at some point early next year. Yeah, and I wanted to ask a little more about that because we're heading into the holidays where lots of people say that they are having these family conversations with people at the Christmas dining table or whatever holiday you're celebrating and, and trying to think about their own political futures. Do we have some kind of timeline about when the president might announce? Those around him are expecting that he will make it, uh, he will officially decide or tell staff to get started at some point early in the new year. But the initial expectation of it happening early in January at some point seems to have been pushed off a little bit. And that may be, frankly, just because of his official calendar. He has a trip to Mexico planned January 9th and 10th, uh, the first uh, second full week of, of January. Uh, there's the potential for a State of the Union address in either late January at some point in February. And so the timing of when you want to do that, either right before or right after that big speech, uh, is part of what, what may be at play. Democrats more broadly, when you talk to them, say there's got to be a conversation about how you campaign exactly in 2024 at a time when people are so much harder to reach. Certainly certain groups of people are so much harder to reach. How do you reach them on your phone? How do you get to them in the streaming space, frankly? How would you reach viewers of this program, for example, if they have to be targeted in some way? And is there something that has to be done in terms of travel or no travel? And what states to emphasize? If you're focusing more on Arizona and Georgia and you're worried about Nevada, where do you make up the math, maybe? Is it North Carolina? Is it somewhere else? So how soon those conversations are had after he makes his decision and whether that affects a formal launch, we'll see. But mm -hmm. you, Scott... Myself, we've covered campaigns long enough to know that if somebody's telling us that they're going to have that conversation over the holidays, they've already had a conversation with their family, right? They wouldn't put themselves in that position without letting 
those closest, nearest, and dearest to them know that, hey, I'm thinking about running for X. So I would yeah. love to be a fly on the wall for one of these holiday conversations, but in many respects, these kinds of conversations probably have already happened. I mean, yeah, it's do you, kind of do like you think, you... Do you really think Mike Pence and Mike Pompeo are going out there without having talked to people about whether I should go out there and say I'm thinking about it? Oh. So. We'll yeah, see. it's kind of like when you ask someone to marry you, you pretty much know the answer. It's just right. going through those motions. Um, Scott, exactly. I do want to talk about the former president, um, someone who has already announced that he's running as Donald Trump. But um, these January 6th transcripts, you've been covering this committee, the ins and outs of it for so long. I know you have been waiting for uh, the bulk of these transcripts to come out. We do have the testimony released uh, from Cassidy Hutchinson, who our viewers will remember um, offered very compelling testimony yeah. over the summer. Um, uh, what, what did we learn from what's been released so far, and what are you looking forward to? Still waiting for the final report. Jamie Raskin, member of the committee, told me we do still expect it by the end of the night. It's still at the printer's office. We'll see if that ends up being the case. They did release these transcripts with that star witness, Cassidy Hutchinson, who really was a poignant part, a powerful part of the summer nationally televised hearing to this committee. Former aide to Mark Meadows, then Trump chief of staff, in close proximity to Meadows on January 6th. What they've released, though, is not her recollections and answers about January 6th. It's actually about the questions she underwent with this committee after her star turn of her mm. testimony. And this is about potential witness tampering, about the influence impact on her to get her to limit what else she tells the committee. Congressman Raskin said that he's concerned there was some influence efforts against Ms. Hutchinson by her first set of legal counsel. These transcripts show she is asked about what she was told to say, what she was told not to say, was she giving pressure, and her responses in the transcripts indicate she might have been. But also, I'll note in the second set of transcripts released, Hutchinson says Mark Meadows knew after Election Day that Trump didn't win. Mm. And then he told others he knew Trump didn't win, but that Meadows was still being pressured by Trump to act on it, and that it was starting to get to him. It was starting to get to Meadows. Hutchinson recounts that. That may be a weight-bearing fact when we get mm. the full report at some point tonight. And just quickly, um, Jamie Raskin, who people have become familiar with over the course of these hearings, is getting a prominent role in next year's Congress. Tell us a little bit more about that. The top Democrat on the House Oversight Committee, which will cut a particularly high profile because the Oversight Committee is the one that's going to lead investigations into Hunter Biden, mm. going to lead investigations into the Biden administration and its operations. Mm -hmm. Jamie Raskin will be the bulwark for Democrats on that committee. Pretty close contest between him and neighboring Jerry Connolly of Virginia, who mm. is vying for it as well. Connolly was making the argument that he's been on this committee a long time. It's kind of been a sole focus of his mm -hmm. while Mr. Raskin was on the January 6th committee and elsewhere. But Raskin certainly made a name for himself, made a lot of very close allies in his caucus because of that mm -hmm. service and it ended up prevailing. A lot of investigations he's been running yeah. and more to come, certainly. Scott McFarland, thank you. Ed O'Keefe, thank you. Gentlemen, have a great holiday and hope to see you soon. You too.